Step number 10 says we continue to take personal inventory. <laughs> and when we're wrong, promptly admitted it. Now, I do not believe that this means... I don't see how a man can fall out of a chair when he's sitting in it, can you? <laughs> I don't mean it, believe this means that we go back to our lives and redo the step forward. I think this means that we look at our day. How closely are we living according to these principles today? How are we doing today? Step 10 has been very, very, very important to me because up until the time I got into this program, there was no way that I could say, I don't know. There's no way I could say I don't know, particularly in business. You don't say I don't know in business. They ask you anything and you answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no way could I say I don't know. I'm quite sure that if you'd asked me to explain Einstein's theory, I'd explained it. <laughs> if you asked me how God created the earth, I'd have told you. And I very likely would have said, now on the third day, we did this and so. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't say, I don't know. I came to the program, and I learned that the truth was the most powerful thing on earth by doing the things that the program told me to do, just by doing it. In business, I learned to say I don't know. But that question's important. Tomorrow I'll know the answer to it. And tomorrow it is. In anything where I didn't know, I said I don't know. And that's very easy because you don't have to remember what you said. When you don't tell them something that you don't know. You don't have to remember. Tell them the truth. You don't have to remember. Another thing is, I was wrong. Well, I didn't go around saying I was wrong. I think I told you this morning. Once I thought I was wrong, but I was mistaken. <laughs> now, the 24th day of June of this year, if we live, and if necessary, don't divorce me between now and then, we'll have 50 years. Double harness. A little time out for bad behavior. <laughs> <laughs> and I catch myself now saying to my wife, I was wrong. You were right all the time. I would have sworn that I was right, that I was wrong all the time. Now that's awful. You know, you've married the same bod for 50 years and tell her you're wrong. <laughs> Isn't that awful? But it's real good. It's real good. Because you're comfortable. When you do it that way, you're comfortable. The most powerful thing on the face of the earth is the simple, unadulterated truth. So much so that somebody said one time, know the truth. And the truth will make you free. Truth will make you free. <clears throat> and in all of our affairs, this holds true. In business and play and family and AA, it works. I've known many over the years, particularly those who have become and maybe still are, so-called circuit speakers, 
who have felt that a little embellishment might make their story more interesting. So they got to build it up a little. And first thing you know, they're drunk. Or they get to thinking they're big in the program. You know, they're experts in this program. Because people tell them how good they are. And they believe their press. The next thing you know, they're drunk. You can't get big in this program, Bob. No way. If you and I could have handled this deal, we would have done so, and we would not be members of our office now. We had plenty of time. I had 43 years to run my life. During which time, I was the star of the show and the director of energies. <clears throat> and I gave it my best shot. All my wit and wisdom I put in. And I lost. I lost. As I told you, at the ripe old age of 43, I was a failure as a husband, a father, a businessman, a man, and a drunk. And that's all the departments I had. But I had any more departments, I'd have been a failure in those two. That's all. And I take credit for that. The last 29 years, I take no credit for it at all. I thank God. And you. And maybe I should put it the other way. I thank you. And God. Because there's people like you that rocked me to sleep on my first night. And it was living with people like you that I came to see. That I had a God of my very own. I didn't even know what it took place. So, in my thinking, maybe I should say first <coughs> that I'm grateful to you. And then I'm grateful to God. Don't make any difference to me because I have come to see that God is people. God is people. And so it don't make any difference. Now, in all of our affairs means at home. You see, the thing that makes this program work for us is Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share. Who share their experience, strength, and hope one with another in love. Who share. There are very few people in Alcoholics Anonymous that will tell you anything. We don't tell. We share. I have a guy that calls me sponsor. Who tells? <laughs> and he makes it sick pretty good. I tell him, says I to him, I says, you're not even a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous is made up of people who share. You don't share it with anybody. You tell them. But, whatever you do, keep doing it. <laughs> Because I go around his birthday and there's 65 sober kooks in his backyard. 65 of them. And every one of them are his babies. And every one of them are people I couldn't touch with a four foot pole. And they're sober. So whatever you're doing, keep doing it. The society could not do without one Clancy. But if it had two, it'd wreck us all the way across the country. <laughs> now, I shared when I discovered I was sober. I started sharing with drunks. I like to think of it like this. Many of you heard me t say this before. I like to think of me as a glass of dirty water. A dirty glass full of dirty water. 
And during my drinking days, I was always knocking it off, quitting. Every time it got too bad, I quit. And when you quit, it was like pouring out the dirty water. And now you got an empty glass and it's dirty. And empty. And it can only be empty so long and you got to fill it again. And you fill it back up with dirty water. When I came to the program, I didn't quit. I haven't quit drinking yet. And I came with a dirty glass full of dirty water. And at the first meeting, a little stream of clear water started running in there. And I liked it, and I came back and came back, and the little stream of clear water kept running in. And after a while, I discovered that the glass was clean, and the water was clean, and the glass was full. And then I had to start trying to give it away, and it was only pit to the drunk, because the drunks gave it to me. And I shared it with the drunks. And as time went on, she started straightening up. And eventually, it was straight. And the water was still running in because I'm still going to be the clear water. And then it was filling in all directions to whosoever will. It was good. And I shared with lots of people, Jews, Gentiles, and Greeks, blacks, whites, all kinds of people. I shared, but my youngest son, I told, I didn't share with him. I told him, <clears throat> because you see, when he came along, he was born with a goose paint in his ears, and I was born with a pitchfork in my hand. And I couldn't understand him. I just couldn't understand him. When he was not high, we lived over in Beverly Hills. We had alleys behind houses. Picked up the garbage and stuff from behind the alley. Old Dick used to run the alleys. They'd find where somebody had thrown away a colorful dress or something. And he'd get it. And he'd bring it in the garage. And he'd make a costume out of it. And he'd get himself some earrings and he'd paint himself all up and have this costume and he'd come out and put on a show. Six years old, seven years old. And I'd look at him and I'd say to myself, what the goddamn hell have I got here? And I started trying to make him over after my design. <laughs> Tried to put a pitchfork in his hand. He didn't know what a pitchfork was. And he was 10, I guess, or 11, when I sobered up. <clears throat> and he got to uh, be a little older, and we sent him to Mona School. And he, uh, he got pretty much the whole package. The kid can paint and draw and play and sing and dance and stuff, you know. And he was taking art. He was taking art and philosophy, as a matter of fact. Art was his major and philosophy was his second. And so I'd go out there and take him to dinner once in a while. And he'd tell me the, uh, values of modernistic and futuristic painting. And he shouldn't have done that. <laughs> <laughs> now mind you, I'm sharing with everybody else. And he tells me about the values of modernistic and futuristic painting. I see the very idea of a guy with my blood in his veins thinking there's value in that stuff. Well, I think I have seen a better picture than that when the old cow slapped her tail up against the side of the barn. <laughs> now, that's a good way to win friends and influence people. If they happen to be your son. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And, of course, when he talked with his friends about philosophy. He got a painter friend by the name of Martin, doing a good job. Has his own children now. And they were talking philosophy in my house. And I sat and listened to him a while. It was obvious to me that he didn't know what they were talking about. So I had to straighten him out. <laughs> and I made him sit there and listen to me for an hour and a half. So when they hadn't killed me, but they didn't. Well, I couldn't understand why we couldn't get along. I couldn't understand. And I was trying my damnedest to get acquainted with that kid, and I could not understand why I couldn't. And we had been living in the house we live in now for about eight, ten years. And we have a tremendous view out of the from every room in the house, as a matter of fact, but particularly out of the living room. And people have been telling me for ten years what they saw out of my window. And it gradually dawned on me, as people kept telling me what they saw out of my window, that nobody that ever looked out of that window told me what I saw. And eventually I came to see that nobody sees what I see out that window. And something started clicking in my mind. Now, up until that time, it had never occurred to me that nobody sees what I see. It had never occurred to me. I grew up thinking the white was white and black was black and a cow was a cow. And anybody that looked at a cow saw a cow. And if they were looking at the same one I saw, they saw the same cow. But they don't. And the way I found it out was people telling me what they saw at my window. And I started thinking, something wrong with me. It isn't the kid, it's me. He sees things that I don't see. And then I got thinking about this philosophy deal. <clears throat> and I saw that I was trying to make the kid cross the street in St. Louis when he was in Chicago. You can't do that, kids. <laughs> You've got to be in St. Louis to cross the street in St. Louis. So I said to my wife, we're going to London. And she says, why? I said to get a credit with the kid. And we went to London. And we went to dinner. And I told this kid how blind I'd been. Totally unaware of the fact that people don't see what I see. How blind I'd been. And how I came to see by people telling me what they saw of me when what he was talking about when he said the values in his face. And I'd come over to apologize to him. To make my amends. And then I told him about the philosophy. And I apologized for that. And I made my amends. And the first thing you know, that we pretty nearly got thrown out of the restaurant. We were laughing and hollering and having a picnic. They put us through out. Because you see, the dam went out. And we shared with each other. After that, we went pretty well all over Europe. And when we came home, he came with us. And we were doing uh, Roanoke to talk on the way home. We got off the plane in Chicago, visited some of my people, and he never wanted to do that. But he wanted to go. And we got down to my mother's place. Mother is 96. Still going. 
She's not mobile, but she's keen as a whip. And we were racing there, and then we were going to drive on down to Louisville, visit a bus there, and on over to Roanoke. And the kid says, I've got to go back to New York. But I'll be in Roanoke on Friday. Says, I've got some business to do in New York. And he went. And I said to my wife, you'll never be in Roanoke. Because, you see, both Miss C and I were talking there. And I knew he wouldn't come. And Friday he was in Roanoke. And I told him before he went, I said, Dick, these people down there are our people. They love Miss C and I. And they won't, uh, they won't leave you alone. You can't be anonymous there because they won't leave you alone. And he said, don't care. And he was there. And he listened to his wife talk, to his mother talk, my wife talk. He listened to Miss C on Friday, Friday night. Or Saturday, I forgot. And he listened to me the next morning. And the tables were round. And there were about ten people at each table. And he told me afterwards that Dick would sit there and listen a little bit. And he'd say, I never knew. I never knew. And a little later, I never knew. Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about taking this thing home to share our experience, strength, and hope. At home, nobody likes to be told anything. We think that we're old enough and smart enough that we should be able to tell our kids they don't want to be told. They want to share, and they want, don't want to know how smart we are. They want to know how we beat ourselves to death and what we did to get out of it. They want to share with us. The language of the heart has no age. One of the great experiences in my life, I guess it's pretty near two years now, they carried me up the North Battleford, Saskatchewan, to the inner provincial ality meeting. We have 12 or 1,500 kids for me to share with. The fabulous weekend. Don't think that they can't understand you when you share with them, because they can. If you share and don't tell, Fantastic. And these women that we married, if the shoe had been on the other foot, my wife wouldn't have lasted 60 days. Not 60 days would I put up with the performance out of my wife that she put up with me. And she put up with me for 20 years. 20 years. Now, you and I, I suppose you're like me. I sort of dreamed all my life, you know, about getting up every morning and having a new woman across the table from me. <laughs> I thought that was a great deal. I thought a guy ought to have that. You know? Particularly, you shouldn't get in a rut. <laughs> Be married to the same bond for 50 years, you know. That's indecent in California. <laughs> But I came to see 
that every morning I have a new woman across the, across the table from me. <clears throat> because, you see, we're changing people. We're changing people. You never heard me before. I'm not the guy I was yesterday. I'm the guy I was yesterday, plus yesterday's experience and its lesson. So we're always new. And that woman that you're married to is always new. One of the greatest handicaps we put on ourselves is categorizing each other, and particularly the members of our own family. When we live close to them, we come to think that we know everything they're going to do, the way they're going to react to everything. We've got to characterize, categorize. But we haven't. Because they're changing too. That's one of the jobs we have in Alcoholics Anonymous. And particularly, it's one of the great jobs that we have where our mates, whether they be the lady who is in Al Anon or the man who is in Al Anon, or who isn't the alcoholic, maybe not in any program. But when a guy gets sober in Alcoholics Anonymous and does these things, he grows like a weed. If he does these things, he can't keep from going. Growing like a weed. And my wife went to meetings with me for six years before Alan was born. And she thought she knew this thing real good. She knew all the words. But she listened to me for six years. Listen for me for six years. Yeah, she'd like to have had me right there where she could punch me. <laughs> and when I was there, she punched me. <laughs> you know, she was listening to me. And we moved to, well, wait a minute. Alanon was born. And she started meeting in Beverly Hills. And I lived in her. And it grew and prospered. And she thought she was doing great because she was the mother hen. And she told him. And we moved to Laguna. When I was 11 years sober, we moved to Laguna. And here she was with nobody to uh, tell. Wasn't any Alan in Laguna. <laughs> and I had my business was still in town. And whilst when we lived in Beverly, I could go get her and take her to meetings with me every night, you know. Have dinner at home, take her to meetings. But when we were at Laguna, that couldn't happen. And so, she got very, very depressed. <coughs> she put the B on me to slow down. I must stay home a little bit because she wasn't... She wasn't getting her the attention that she ought to have. She had no friends down there. That lasted, lasted from February to Thanksgiving, trying to slow down. And I got so uncomfortable I couldn't live. So after we had a Thanksgiving dinner on this year, the kids were there, and let's see. And I told them, I says, kids, and let's see, I got an announcement to make. From now on, when that phone rings, I got to go. I can't pick and choose what I'm going to do. I can't tell this guy, yeah, I'll talk for you, and this one I won't talk for you. They'll be drunk in both places. And I can't do it. And when that phone rings, I've got to do what they want me to do. But in my power. And if you don't like it, get yourself another husband and get yourself another father. I had to do it because I, really, I couldn't live that way. 
Suppose the guy hadn't have been there when I went. You know. So. Dick sort of came into that picture, too. He said, Mom, why don't you start another Alanon group? Because his mother was deeply depressed. And she started another Alanon group. And the next thing you know, she was going down. Because this time, she started it for her. And she started going like a weed. And she's found the same thing I found. And it's a beautiful thing. And we share. We share all the time. Now, we don't always agree, but it isn't necessary. We've learned how to disagree and not be disagreeable. And that's a good thing, you know. And we share. We don't tell. I don't tell anybody. You don't tell me. We share. Now, this is what we're talking about. To practice these principles in all of our affairs. In all of our affairs. Now, we said this morning... That when we learned why people did what they did, they couldn't hurt us. That people do what they do because they have to, not because they want to. When we know better, we do better. One of the things that we didn't speak of yet was this. That in simple psychology, they told us that the two great needs of the individual are to be needed and to be loved. Everybody gets that in psychology, I guess. The two great needs are to be needed and to be loved. And that's just as backwards as everything else you told me. What about business and about God? Totally backwards. The two great needs of the individual are to love and to do. These are the great needs of the individual. To love and to do. A certain doctor that writes on my blackboard <laughs> called me one night at midnight. And he said, Chuck, what's your definition of love? I said, it's the same at 10 o'clock in the morning as it's midnight. <laughs> what the hell are you calling me at midnight for? He says, what's your definition of love? I said, you wouldn't like it. Well, he says, what is it? I said, action. He says, what do you mean? Action. I said, action. If you love somebody, you do things for them. You do things. You will trade with them. There's no barter in love. There's no barter in love. You do things because you want to. With no strings on it at all. Marriage isn't a 50 50 thing, it isn't a 75 25 thing. Marriage is a thousand or nothing. You don't barter. You don't barter with God, and you don't barter with each other. The simple, unadulterated truth. The motivation. Love. And love is the fulfillment of the law. You do it because you love it, for free and for fun. Fantastic thing. Yes. You do have a new woman across the table from me every morning. It's beautiful. How much more interesting life is. Now, I had one more thing that was fantastic in my life that uh, I want to share with you. Came out of total collapse, total failure. And the fact that I had already practiced 
completely ruined my body and my mind. Many of you have heard me say that when I got here, it took me over six months to put the Trinity Prayer together in English. Not spiritually, in English. I couldn't make that thing make sense. That's the kind of a mind I brought. And it took me two and a half years to get over falling on my face. After my last book. That's the kind of body I brought. I guess I had as many related disorders as you usually have. My wife was divorcing me. I believe that to be a related disorder. My kids wouldn't come home when I was around. I think that's a sort of a related disorder. My boss had sent word to the house that the driver stepped foot in the plant again and broke through the window. I think that's a related disorder. Because that means that you ain't got nothing coming in. I had no health, no sanity, no job, no nothing. But I came here merely for sobriety. Just for sobriety. So that I might rub out what I could of the record before I died. As I told you yesterday, I knew I was going to die. Because it come that close to it, and that's the last time out, and this was worse. So I had accepted the fact that everything good to me in life was gone and should be gone, and I wasn't entitled out of back. And I had accepted death. So I wanted nothing for me, not even surprise. And incidentally, it's the greatest freedom on the face of the earth. Freedom is to not want nothing, no time for yourself. This is total freedom. Now, my first surrender, done by the bottle, lasted three and a half years. The greatest freedom ever could see which I ever lived. And it was a period of total non expectancy. Total non expectancy. From God in man. My wife, my kids, nobody. My boss, nobody. The greatest period of marriage through which I ever know. All the little pieces of jigsaw puzzle of life fell together in that first two and a half years. But a bad thing happened. I became somebody again in those three and a half years. And when you're somebody, you've got rights. And when you've got rights, you have to defend them. <laughs> so here I find myself, after three and a half years, a peace, freedom, having to consciously surrender. And it griped the hell out of me. I couldn't make sense out of it, John. Here for three and a half years, I've been free. And now I have to start consciously surrendering. And I'm saying to myself, why does this thing come back? Why, why, why? And I looked at it for the next 13 years. And I was 16 years and six months sober before I got an answer to that thing. That was satisfactory to me. And after 16 years and six months, I got an answer that's totally satisfactory. I found something good in the human ego. It's the bone of the saddle. It's the thing that keeps us walking. And when you and I have committed ourselves, lonely, we made a decision to turn the world and eyes over the care of God. When we have made this commitment, there's no way that we can stop walking. We get fat and complacent and we stop walking and we get our tits caught in the ringer. And the harder we pull, the worse it hurts. And we find that we either have to surrender again. And so we start consciously surrendering. I did. But I didn't like it. And I never liked it for the 16 years. 
for 13 more years before I got the answer. Now I am convinced that we'll never reach a point where we will have to surrender. That time will never come. An infinite father, an infinite child, and an infinite journey. Now, it took me 70 years to learn that it isn't what we know that makes this life so consumingly interesting. It's what we don't know. It's what we don't know. The thing that makes this life so fantastic is the discoveries as we walk up these stairs. There will always be as much ahead of us as there is right now. An infinite body, infinity. I don't even know what it means. Infinity. An infinite father, an infinite child, and an infinite journey. No destination. An infinite journey. And there will always be as much ahead of it as there is right now. Fantastic. And that's the wonder of this thing called life. That's what makes it so consumingly interesting. It's not what we know. It's what we don't know. Sharing our experience, strength, and hope one with another in love. In all the departments of our life. The language of the heart has no age. And when we see that this life does not contain barter, even in the business world, it's, it's, it's amazingly wonderful. It's amazingly wonderful. Now, we're going to talk about the business world. What time do we start? We got some more time? It's good. I was afraid I was running out of time. We won't get through with this, but we're going to talk about it a little. On the Thursday before Christmas, 1945, I hated my job. I hated my boss. And I hated the people who worked for it. The job was beneath my dignity. Anybody with my ability should be at least a senator, if not president of the United States. And here I was in the fixture business, you know. And it was obvious to me that I was the only one around that had any brains. And the boss had all the money, and he was telling me what to do. And the very injustice of the situation. Um, Caused me to do a little drinking. <laughs> that was the Thursday before Christmas. The Friday before Christmas, he called me in. Gave me that little talk and gave me a few thousand bucks for a Christmas present. And I got drunk on the way home. Came to after the middle of January. Finally went down there. By the end of January. And he came in and threw me out. Threw me through the window, but he didn't. <laughs> and being in the state I was in, physically and mentally, it took everything I had to do the simplest things. To dress myself was a major operation. And it forced me, by necessity, to give my entire interest, attention, and love to the thing I was doing. I couldn't do it. And this is one of the greatest lessons I ever learned. And of course, this too was out of absolute necessity. I didn't figure this out. But anything that we give our entire interest, attention, and love to is the most interesting thing in the world. 
Ik wil even naar in bed zijn, dressing. The most interesting thing in the world. Now I went down to that office to clear up my desk. That was the the, the office and the home were the two things that I'd found up the worst. And so there's where I had to do my stuff. Mainly, that was my big job, to rub out the record, you see. And I started rubbing out a record in the business. Helping people do things that they needed to have done because I wanted to. And by necessity, giving my entire interest, attention, and love to the thing at hand. And I got lost in doing that. And as I told you yesterday, after maybe two years, I discovered that I was still trying to clean up my desk. Lest I forget it. When I was 11 years sober, I bought the business. <laughs> and I owned it until three years ago. When I sold out. And when I sold out, about this many men worked for me. And many of them had been with me for many years. And they had an eighth of an inch of skin inside their hands. They were mechanics. They were machine men. They were metal men. They were carpenters. They were installers. And they worked with their hands. And when I sold that business, everyone was monkey's balls. Everyone of them cried, and I cried. I had learned to love that business. And love the guys that were in it, working with me. And that was the business I hated on the Thursday before Christmas. Well, this is what we're talking about. When you give your entire interest, attention, and love to the thing at hand, it becomes the most interesting thing in the world. Now, a few years before, I wouldn't have drawn a plan for Jesus Christ. I was too big a man. You know, I had a guy working for me. And I told him what to draw. And he didn't draw it like I told him. He got hell, you know. <laughs> I went back down there. Last of January 1946. And I didn't have anybody working for me. And I stopped drawing those plans of myself. And I drew them till I got out of the business. I never had anybody in there drawing plans. I drew them. And it was amazing. thinking I want or don't want to like or don't like I get guys, guys, guys. You rub out a record by doing something for somebody without a press tag on it. And it's amazing what happens. It's amazing. For instance, After I'd been sober a while, there was a Jewish gentleman who had been in the business for a long time, food business, and he retired. They did a lot of dough, and he retired. <coughs> and he had two sons-in-law, and he was going to build a building for his kids, for two sons-in-law. Set them up in the market bid. And at that time, it was the biggest single floor operation in the country. 
It's time out of market till I've ever seen it. And it came time for me to go see him. Now, he uh, he was off singing the, what was called at that time, the palace market. On Manchester, on uh, Sepulveda, did just south of Manchester. One of his sons in law was running that market. He called it palace market. And over the meat department, there was a series of offices and a little balcony. And it came time for me to go see this guy. And I went to see him. And there were a lot of people on the balcony. Waiting to go in, and I waited my turn, and by the time I got ready, there were a lot of other people waiting to see you. And the door was open. It was the office. And I went in, and this guy's name is Morris Weisstein. God rest his soul, he's gone now. And Morris sat there looking like an accident going someplace to happen. And he told me what I was going to have to do if I got his business. And it took him about five minutes to tell me. And when he got through, I said, Morris, I think you got me wrong. You're talking like I came out here to sell you something. I didn't. I came out here to help you if I can. And if I can't, you're busy and so am I. <clears throat> and he leaned back in his chair and he says, I know it, Charlie. And I put it in the market for him, some $75,000. And when his market opened, a bunch of these people that were on the balcony were out there to see the opening, you know, as all the vendors did in those days. And I showed up, and they grabbed me, and they took me off in the corner, and they says, Charlie, I was Charlie in business. Says that was the greatest piece of reverse psychology that we've ever seen. Says we've been talking about it ever since. Says what are you talking about? Well, he says, we heard you. Says you went in there to see Morris. And he says, I haven't got anything so. And you come out with a $75,000 order. Greatest piece of reverse psychology that we've ever seen. Says what the hell are you talking about? If that guy was subject to reverse psychology, he wouldn't have the two million dollars to put this thing in. He knows more about reverse psychology than all of us put together. I told him the simple, unadulterated truth, and he knew it. That's what I'm talking about. He knew it. I said, you think you did me wrong? You think I came out here to tell you something? I didn't. I need to help you if I can, and if I can't, you're busy, and so am I. And I met every syllable of it, and he knew it. You see, this thing we call the truth is, is a very powerful thing. It's the most powerful force on earth. And there's no barter in it. Now, people sat across the desk from me for 25 years. First, they would tell me, you're a damn liar. Business cannot be done this way. You're a damn liar. And they didn't even make me mad. I just laughed. Because they didn't know something I knew, because I'd been doing it that way for 10 years, and it was all right. <laughs> so I just went ahead doing it. And uh, pretty soon they were coming in. Everybody in life business, we would call them competitors if we called anybody competitors, but I didn't have any competitors, because I wasn't competing with anybody. I was just helping my people do things that need to have done because I wanted to. And everybody came in the last few years who were in like business. And they sit down and they say to me, uh, how, do, how do you do these things? You know, the ones that told me I was a darn liar. Because they couldn't even bid the business I was working with, you know. They'd go to see bonds and they'd say, look, uh, 
You're putting it in this new market. I, I want to bid on it. They say, Charlie's going to put it in. They say, what do you mean? They say, Charlie's going to put it in. Well, he says, uh, uh, how do you know he's not going to take your IT? you got to have some bids to, to compare. He says, Charlie's going to put it in. He says, it costs money to bid one of these jobs. Go, go see somebody else. And so they started coming in the city, and they say, how do you do these things? And I took two hours out, and I tell them. <laughs> I tell them exactly. And they'd leave thinking, I got his, I got his number now. I'll fix him. <laughs> I know how he does it. I'll get him. But they didn't get me. <laughs> they did get the business. Because, you see, they weren't motivated. As I was. They weren't motivated that way. They thought you had to outthink, outperform, and outmaneuver. I knew better. Because I did it that way 30 years and ended up in the bottom of the sink pit. And I did it for free and for fun, helping God's kids do things they needed to have done because I wanted to. For 25 years, and I got rich. And I wasn't even trying to get rich. They made me rich. Now, I'm going to tell you a couple other things, because nearly all you guys are still busy. And you know, you know very well that this is impossible. So, you can say when you get to, well, I heard that mutt, but he's a liar. You know? couple of my Jewish friends had a market at, at uh, Trenshaw on 101, called Foods Company. Now these boys were a couple of youngsters about your age. I had done business with their dad years before, when they were a little bitty old kid running around the store. And uh, I did business with them. And they wanted to change the fixtures in the liquor department. And they had an architect. Designer. Designed some fixtures and stuff. And called me and said, come down and take a look at this. Tell me what they're worth. And I went and looked at them. And I said, hey, this guy's drawn up some pretty fancy stuff. I'd never drawn you up anything that fancy because it's very expensive. Well, he said, what do you think it's going to cost? And there weren't many of them. And I said, hey, I, my guess is it cost you $4,500. He says, put them in. And I put them in. And they were in the store and they had them working. They were doing a good job for him. And I had my cost in. And I had $5,700 in. <laughs> my money. 5700 bucks. And I called him and I said, hey, do you remember what I quoted you to those pictures? And he said, no, but he says, I suppose I have it written down here someplace on my desk. Well, I said, don't look for it. I'll tell you. It's $4,500. And I said, hey, you can have them for 4500 They're in your store and they're doing a good job. And you can have them for $4,500 because that's what I guessed on it. But I was wrong. I have fifty-seven hundred dollars in those pictures. He says Charlie had a profit in sending the bill, and I said, "Don't want that. I made the mistake, but I would like to get my money out of it." He said, "Charlie, put a profit on it and send me a bill, and I'll pay you." I said, "No, but I'll bill you fifty-seven hundred dollars if that if that's all right with you." He says, "If that's the way you want to do it." Now you know better than that. <laughs> Nobody would do that. I bet him $5,700 in the pay. I had another outfit that I did business with. The last deal I put in for him was at, uh, it was called Pride Center. And it was Paul Brook and Victory out in the uh, West Valley. It was a big deal. 
and we put it in, and it was open, and it was running about maybe 90 days. Did a good job. Beautiful thing. And uh, Dave Shiro called me one day, and he said, Charlie, you haven't bid me. And I said, no, Dave. I didn't know what to bid you. <laughs> but I got caught in now, and I can get it together for you pretty fast. He says, how fast? I says, probably an hour, I can call you back. Well, he says, please do. We want to finance this thing. And we have to know the amount. So call me back as quick as can, and now I have to go for it. And I called him, I said, Dave, are you sitting down? And he said, yeah. I said, are you alone in the office? He said, no, Charlie's sitting across the from me. I said, your heart all right. <laughs> He doesn't have no trouble with it. Well, I said, here it comes. You owe me $225,000. He said, well, isn't that too bad? He said, I just wrote on a slip of paper, $225,000 and handed it over to Charlie across the desk. He says, you ought to hire me as an estimator. <laughs> to send me a bill. Now, you know that's wrong. <laughs> He's got to say, well, how about the sales tax? Can you take off the sales tax? Mm -hmm. Not a word. Send me a bill. I was in trouble. Nineteen hundred and fifty-eight. Pretty bad trouble. And I had to have some business. I had a vacant plant. And it cost me $13,500 a week to keep the doors open. And I had to get some business, so I went out to get it. And I had five deals that I thought I could get. Deals that I'd worked on. And it looked like they were mine. And I went to get them. And one after another, they evaporated. But the last one could not evaporate. Because the two owners of the deal were members of Alcoholics Anonymous. Twenty-eight of the high echelon were members of Alcoholics Anonymous. I will quote you. And that was my deal, and it couldn't be anybody else's deal because I'd done all the thinking, all the planning, everything I'd gotten the deal together for. And it was mine. And I went down to get it. And about four or five others went for lunch and had a good time down there. Welch's on Atlantic came back and everybody left like rats from a sinking ship. <laughs> There's nobody left but Harold Hodges and myself. And we went into his office and I reached for the money. And he says, Chuck, he says, I thought you could never get yourself out of that mess you were in up there. And I gave this deal to Hill. It was the last one. No one anymore. And about five minutes later, he says, uh, Chuck, why don't you say something? <laughs> I said, Harold, there's nothing to say. And I went out and started to drive back to the town. They were their offices in Long Beach. My plant was 40 an millimeter, and I couldn't drive, so I drove off the road. And I sat there, and I looked at myself for a while, and I couldn't, I couldn't get myself together. Here, yeah, everything had just evaporated right in front of my eyes. And I finally came to see that here I had gone out for the first time in years to get some business. Twelve years before, I'd started making 12-step calls in business, helping people do things they need to have done because I wanted to. And here, uh, there was a pinch, and I had to go get it. And I went out there to get it. And everything evaporated. And I said to myself, can't get any worse. Why don't you start making 12-step calls in business like you did 12 years ago. Let the chips fall where they may. 
Throw it into the business back to my partner. They started making draw set calls. And here's something that every one of you will know is impossible. Even those who aren't in business, the judges will know this is no good. Where is that judge? Oh, there he is. <laughs> he was pretty good this morning when you guys were here. So, I got back to the office, and either that day or the next, I got a call from a guy. San Bernardino. And he says, Charlie, I have the feeling you're in trouble. And I have written out a check for $50,000 in your name, and it's lying here on this desk of mine. You don't sign a note. You don't pay any interest. We'll apply it to the next deal we have. Come and get it if you need it. I don't know what he's doing on, but I have the feeling. I said, I'm going to Miami tonight. I'm going to be going a week to the FMI Institute. That was the supermarket institute. You can either come and get it now, or you can come after I get it back. And boy, I'm telling you something. That was something. And I said, Milton, go ahead to Miami. And if I need it when you come back, I'll come and get it. But I want you to know that I'll never forget what you just said to me. It's beautiful. And by the time he got back from Miami, I didn't need it. The place had filled up and it was full until I sold it. Now, gentlemen, what am I talking about? Am I trying to tell you how good I am? No, sir. No, sir. I'm trying to tell you how good you are. The gift of God was made at the foundations of the earth. In my book, God hasn't got anything to give me. Not because he hasn't got anything, but because he already did. The gift of God was made at the foundations of the earth. He gave us the universe. He gave us himself. At the foundation of the earth. When I was sitting in that same tower, sitting now, with everything gone, the blackest moment of my life, the universe was mine. God was mine, and all that he had was mine. He knew it, but I didn't. I had to discover it. And being an alcoholic, I had to discover it in my own way and in my own time. <clears throat> God loved me just as much that day as he does now. Just the same. No different. But he never kept me from making mistakes. He's a gentleman. God. He don't intrude where he's not wanted. So, he never kept me from making mistakes. He loved me enough to allow me to make my own mistakes. That I might the sooner run out of my own resources and come back home where I belong. So, My business is to go about his business. That's his business to take care of. That is not my business. That's his business. Now, what is his business that I'm going about? Helping his kids do things they need to have done because I want to. A 12-step call in business. A 12-step call at home. A 12-step call in AA. A 12-step call in play. Just worrying about our father's business. That's my business. It's his business to him. And he's done an infinitely better job than I ever did. And I'm most grateful. 
Now we talk about prayer a little this morning. Yeah. Wondering why we didn't start these meetings and close them maybe with prayer. And I told you, as far as I'm concerned, this is a prayer. This is a prayer. My life is a prayer. If you'd ask me what your religion, I would say it's the way I live. That's my religion. Don't make it ever what I call myself. It's the way I live. That's my religion. And so, that's my business, to go about his business. Because I want to. Now, there are a couple of little things that I learned many, many years ago that fit right into this picture. There's an old Upanishad that comes out of India. Most of you scholars know about the Upanishads and the Vedas of India. <laughs> I had a guy down, Bob praying when we were down there last, who was a Vedantist. And he was telling me what a bunch of butchers we were in AA, as far as spiritual things were concerned. He was telling me that we had to purify our hearts. <laughs> so we would be worthy to see God. We had to purify our hearts. I said, yeah. <laughs> I said, I was through that route myself. I purified the hell out of my heart. And the purer I got, the drunker I got. <laughs> I said, you know something, bud? I'm sitting here living in Cuba and I see God. And he didn't know what I was talking about. He couldn't know, you know. Because he thought there was another thing. And there were four different things you got to do. Yogi this and yogi that. And yogi these two things. And you yogi yourself right into a purified spirit. <laughs> then you see God. Hmm. I'm sure glad that that ain't the way it is. I'm sure get glad that the God that there is is not anything like the God that I was told about. I'm most happy about that. <clears throat> now this humanity that says this. The whole world is the garment of the Lord. Renounce it. And receive it back as the gift of God. What does it mean? It means that as long as these things were important to me, I couldn't have them. I beat my brains out for 30 years to get the things I thought I was born without. And ended up in the bottom of the snake pit. Now, I wasn't a fast buck artist. I wasn't a confidence man. I worked hard to get it. And I ended up in the bottom of the snake pit. And then I put in 25 years trying to add two. And all the things I beat my brains out to get are mine, and infinitely more so. When they're un unimportant to me, they belong to me. The whole world is the God of the Lord. Renounce it and receive it back as a gift of God. It's beautiful. And they say another thing. They say that anything that's worth doing is an end in itself. That anything that's done as a means to an end is self-robbery. Now, what does that mean? I had we were 50 men working for me. 35 of them worked for a paycheck. They lost five days and lived two. Out of every week. They worked for a paycheck. Fifteen of them worked for fun. They had a picnic. They never lost any time. And they were my premium men. They got more money than anybody else. And they lived seven days a week. Lost no time. Anything done as a means to an end is self-robbery. 
even to be good for something is self robbery. Even if it's being good to go to heaven. It's pretty good motivation. But it's self robbery. Because there's no barter in this deal. No barter at all. We do it for free and for fun because we love it. Fascinating. It's to be good for nothing. This is the freedom of life. Just to be good for nothing. That's not self robbery. That's for fun and for free. Now, I said a while ago, in my opinion, the gift of God was made the foundation of the earth. I'm not the first guy that's ever said that. It's written. Fear not, little flock, it's the Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. Fear not, little flock, it's the Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. Don't say you got to earn it. It is written, take no thought of tomorrow, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, or wherewithal you should be clothed. Your Heavenly Father knows what you have need of for you. Yes. It is written, whatsoever you desire when you pray, believe that you have it. And you'll receive it. Now, how in the world are you going to believe that you got something that you ain't got? How are you going to believe it? <laughs> There's a trick to it. You gotta know that the gift of God was made the foundation of the earth. That God's will for you, his child, is fulfillment, peace, and joy. And that every good and perfect gift is from his hand. So when we recognize this, then we know that what we might pray for is already ours. It's already ours, the gift of God to his kid. No border. Now, lastly, for this session, I'm doing pretty good. You know, I'm holding the time limit right, right, put nearly on the dot. <laughs> this is a new deal for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's reported in the fellowship. They say, what comes after Chamberlain? And they say, Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, I'm ending up right on time. The easy way is the right way. Way is the wrong way. There's an easy way and a hard way to do this program. The hard way is to try to do it yourself. The easy way is to know that you can't. To know that you can't. To recognize the need for help. Now, I have never asked God one time in 29 years. Keep me sober. I never asked him once. I thanked him a million times, but I've never asked him once to keep me sober. Because that's not the way I read my book. The way I read my book, it says here are the steps we took. When we took them, something happens. When we don't took them, nothing happens. So... I told Father Barney, I said, I've never asked God to keep you sober. He says, why not? I said, I think that's not his business. I think it's my business to do these things. And his business to take care of him. And he does it. I don't have to tell him what to do about his business. And you guys told me what to do about mine. And I do it. Here are the steps I take. I'm sober. And many, many good things have happened in my life.